person to take this time to quiet the mind and tend the body and the heart and come into a mindful, loving presence with yourself. And as you close your eyes, maybe take one or two deeper breaths. <sighs> Allow things to settle just here and now. And I will add some guidance throughout this meditation. If it is annoying, you can always just mute the sound. <laughs> if it's helpful, take the pieces that are useful to you. So as you sit quietly, to deepen the sense of steadiness. Feel your buttocks on the chair or the cushion, whatever you're seated upon, your feet touching the ground or the earth, the floor, and imagine that you have roots that go down from your body, energetic roots, down into the earth, deep into the earth, so that you are sitting like a great tree where the winds can come and blow. The tree is steady and rooted in the earth, just where you are. Notice as you sit quietly how your body breathes itself with no effort or direction. Feel or sense how the bodies gently and naturally inspire, expire, breathing in and out, rise and fall of chest or belly, coolness in the nostrils. And as you sense the breath and the body breathing itself, relax into each breath so that there's a steadying and a calm that's invited, breathing in and out. Letting calm and ease grow with each breath. And notice as you feel the body breathe itself. Notice how you can pay attention to your body, how you can bring body and mindful loving awareness together. Just now, loving awareness, feeling this breathing body And let your awareness 
sense all the energies of your body. The sense of pleasure or places of pain. Both are found. Areas of tension, things that you've held in the body in this difficult time. And feeling how the breath breathes itself gently. Notice the areas of tension or tightness the places that are held in the body. And with a loving awareness, invite them to open by getting stronger or increase. Invite them to show themselves to you so you can feel them fully. And with each area of tension, tightness, let it expand and get stronger and fill the body or even the room. Let it open. So it's all felt fully with loving awareness. And notice how when you make space and allow that which is tight or hurt, hurting or painful or closed or throbbing to be felt fully and to open more. That the space around it also gets bigger. And as it opens, It naturally also gets softer. It eases with that space. Now you're present for your body with this loving awareness, just letting it open as it wishes and breathing itself. In the quality of love even more for this body that's carried you so many steps and miles in so many places. Maybe if you can mute your sound. Bells come and go, sounds of rustling. And you are the loving awareness itself. First, just tending this precious body. Letting open as it will. Breathe with ease.
And now with the same loving awareness or attention, begin to notice the state of your heart. Just as you can feel all that your body carries. Pay attention now to any of the emotions that are present. There might be calm or pleasure or ease. But your heart is also being, you know, taxed at this time, carrying concern or sadness or grief or the suffering carrying fear or even anger, outrage or loss, carrying longing as you get restless, longing to connect, carrying cre creativity and love and humor, all the feelings of the heart. And you are the loving awareness. Now let the feelings of the heart open and display themselves, all that's been carried. And let them be felt fully, whatever they are, just now. Let them fill the body and the room whatever the heart needs to open and show you it's been carrying. And you are the loving attention, the loving awareness, the witnessing of all these emotions. Now you notice that you can either rest your attention with your body, feeling it breathe itself and letting the body open as it will. Or you can let the emotional body and the heart's feelings open and display themselves, be felt fully. And you are the field of love, tending this body and heart, letting it open just now. And now with this same loving awareness, you can pay attention to your mind, that inner organ of energy and images and thoughts and words that continues to produce more thoughts and imagination and plans and remembering and sorting and figuring and 
hoping and judging and expecting and analyzing and reflecting. And it keeps going. All the different thoughts and images and worries and hopes and visions and positive things. And you kind of step back. The mind's been busy almost like a hamster wheel, especially in tough times, trying to protect you and sort it out. And you just feel the energy of the mind. It's calmed down already a little as we sit. And you hold the mind with compassion. It's been trying to help and protect you. You can say thank you. Thank you for all those thoughts. Thank you for trying to protect me. I'm okay just now. I'm all right, you can relax. And feel the ease, the letdown, as you hold your mind with loving awareness and gratitude, thank you. It can soften, quiet. And more and more as you sit, you become the loving awareness, the loving attention that can feel your body and breath. And say thank you, thank you for caring so much. They can feel your heart and all the emotions and love and care and longing, pain the heart carries, holding with compassion. Oh, this heart, tender. Thank you, thank you for caring so much. I'm okay just now, thank you. You can rest. Let the heart come to rest. And now simply and mysteriously, you have become the loving awareness, the witness. With loving attention, you're the witness to this remarkable body with all its experiences, but it's not who you are. You are the loving awareness that's become the field of love that holds all the emotions of the heart, the witness to the heart. But it's not who you are, those emotions. They come and go. They play and are felt. You are the awareness. You're the awareness of mind, knowing all the states of mind, the plans and images and words.
And as you feel into the awareness and turn your attention to awareness itself, silent, spacious, peaceful, vast and open. You are the loving awareness witnessing this life, peaceful, spacious. This is your true nature. Consciousness itself. Rest at ease. You are the loving awareness. And sense the body breathing itself with calm. And the heart held with loving awareness and compassion settles down, ease. The mind quiets. And you become the Buddha, the peaceful one, who's awake, can tend to all things, the body and heart and mind and things around, can do so from a place of spacious peace. Calm, steady. Gracious and wise. The point of meditation 
isn't to get somewhere else, but to actually become who, to remember who we really are, to come alive in the present moment as loving awareness itself. To remember and in bali they say when a little child is born they don't even let the babies touch the earth for six months they carry them they say those who are closest to the gods are tiny infants who've just come from the other world or old people who are getting ready to return to it and the people furthest from the gods are middle-aged people with mortgages who forget who they really are so our task, especially in this difficult time, is to stop, is to go deep, as the I Ching says, my friend Peter Levine, through the I Ching and came up with the well that says to go deep in this time, down deep, where there's neither increase nor decrease, but something timeless. And otherwise, we can get caught up in all of the anxiety and fear because part of what's gone viral is fear, not the virus itself. And the word pandemic comes from the Greek pan. It's also the root of panic and pandemonium. It's the wildness of the, the god pan, you know, dancing. And this is one of the energies of life, but it's not the only energy. And of course, there is the great cultural anxiety and global fears. But also, there's our response. I watched some of the, which many of you did, of the concert and celebration of uh, working people and healing people, you know, of the healers and so many, that eight hour concert that Lady Gaga had stewarded with all the amazing and wonderful singers. And part of what was most moving about it was the clips of doctors and nurses and frontline people and bus drivers and people who are in the warehouses and all of that saying, we're with you, we're part of you. And there was this sense of solidarity. I also love that there's so much humor that's coming out, even in the face of all this. Um, Dolly Parton, um, wrote a song. Here's the lyrics. This too shall pass as all things will. If the virus don't kill us, the stay at home will. The kids are bored and restless. They scream and yell and squawk. And the teens and tweens, they're just plain mean. They bite your bleeping head off. And all those loving couples that were once so sweet and cozy, now they fight like cats and dogs like Donald and Pelosi. Lord, get us back to school and get us back to work and get out of this god dang house before somebody gets hurt. And Lord, please find a vaccination in the form of a shot or a pill, because if the virus don't kill us, the stay in home will. You know, and so here we are all cooped up with our loved ones. And as Jimmy Fallon had somebody, you know, tweet into the Tonight Show that she was already considering expelling her children from homeschool. So we have to deal with this and with one another. And how do we do it? And what really matters? A poem by Thomas Santolella. In the evening, we shall be examined on love. And it won't be multiple choice. In the evening, when the sky is turned that certain blue, the blue of exam books, we shall climb the hill as the light empties and park our tired bodies on a bench above the city and try to fill in the blanks. We shall be examined on love like students who don't even recall signing up for the course and now must take their orals, forced to speak for once from the heart. Forced to speak for once from the heart. And this is really the curriculum of this life in this incarnation, in the midst of it all. So I wanna talk about how we hold this and how we navigate this with the practice that we just did together and with a deeper understanding. We're part of the great mystery and the Buddhist text begin, O nobly born, 
you who are the sons and daughters of the awakened ones, remember who you really are. Remember your true nature, your Buddha nature. And of course, there's that wonderful poem from Juan Ramon Jimenez, where he says, yo no so yo, I am not I. I'm this one walking beside me whom I do not see, whom at times I manage to visit, and at other times I forget. The one who remains silent when I talk, the one who forgives sweet when I hate, the one who takes a walk when I am indoors, the one who will remain standing when I die. And in the meditation, we shifted from the experience of body, heart, and mind to become the loving witness itself of our restlessness, our doubting and fearful mind, our tears, our longing, our love, to bow to all of these things. But of course, that's a very nice idea. How do we actually embody it? And I know being here with my beloved Trudy, we're mostly doing good, but once in a while we get on each other's nerves like human beings do. And I have a practice. I actually told her about it. It's sort of a secret practice I have. Um, I think about the passage from Thomas Merton where he talked about seeing the secret beauty behind the eyes of every being. And my secret practice is if I find frustration or annoyance, I look at her, I look at her eyes, and I see the girl, the innocent child, the young girl, the young teenager that's in there with so much possibility and beauty and love. And when I see that secret beauty, then the rest falls away. Even though I cleaned the stove, we are taking turns cleaning the house. And then she came and said, Jack, you know, you can't just wipe the grease away. And I had to learn a whole new deep dharma of what it means to properly clean the stove. Thank you, my beloved. So we become loving awareness. We become the witness to the joys and sorrows, to the praise and blame, to the things that are joyful and wonderful in our life and the things that are difficult. And in this, we open to a deeper mystery. We open to a mystery of becoming that one, as Machado says, who sees ourselves walking or talking, but we know we're greater than this. We're not just caught in our personality and in our small self. We are actually timeless awareness itself, the Buddha nature itself, witnessing it all. So the story I want to tell, which I've told last time a couple or a few years ago and sometime a decade before that, is a famous story of initiation. And initiation means going through a difficulty in order to find that which is unshakable. Sometimes it's deliberate where the Maasai will send a young man out into the desert with a spear and the initiation is to confront and kill a lion and bring it back to prove that they're a man or a young woman in that Maasai people who learns what it means to give birth and become a, a creator of the world through their body. But an initiation requires us to face a difficulty, to go through such a narrow place that it divests us of all our baggage, of all the things that we held as being true or dear, to find something deeper. So Karl Fried Durkheim, the great Zen teacher writes, the person who really being on the way falls upon hard times in the world will not as a consequence turn to those friends who offer comfort and encourage their old self to survive. Rather, they'll seek out someone who will faithfully and inexorably help them to risk themselves so that they may endure the difficulty and pass courageously through it. Only to the extent that a person exposes themselves over and over again to annihilation 
can that which is indestructible be found within them. In this daring lies dignity and the spirit of true awakening. And sometimes initiation is deliberate, but most often it comes, as they say in the Greek, as a katabas, as a blow, an accident, an illness, a divorce, a loss of business, a, um, something that happens in your family. But now we have the blow to our worldwide and global culture. And it's a cultural initiation that's released some of the furies on the earth. And if you look into the Greek myths of the furies, none of the gods can stop them. Vengeance and the power of the furies, paranoia, because they arise when truth is not being honored. And in the end, the only thing that could stop them was the great goddess of wisdom, Athena, who took them into her temple and made an altar and say, we respect the truth that need to be spoken, and thus we respect you. So here we are needing to embrace all of the difficulty and to go through it as an initiation and say, yes, we will bring all this into the temple of our awareness. So the ancient story, a myth, is of Nachiketa from the Kata Upanishads. And Nachiketa was a young man years ago, centuries ago, born into a wealthy family in the top 1% of the culture in a life of privilege. And when Nachiketa's father became old and was frightened of illness and epidemics that could come and aging and frightened of death, he talked to the priests at one of the temples, the leaders who told him, if you want to be certain to have a beautiful birth after death or have a beautiful death, you must make a great offering to the temple. You know how that happens in some forms of religion. And so he decided to trust them. And he made a huge public ceremony in which he had a parade and brought all his cattle and gold and wealth. I give all that I value to the temple. And this was his way of trying to buy security with everything that he had gained in this life. But his son, Nachiketa, could see the hypocrisy of it, the sham of it. You can't buy security with money. Doesn't matter how much money you have. You're still human and you still have to go through what we all have to go through as human beings. I give all I value to the priests and temple. And his son was so upset at this. He said out loud in front of everyone, all you value, what about your son? as if to shame his father for his hypocrisy and sham. And being publicly rebuked in this way, his father turned to him and says, I give you, I give you to death. For he was mortified by what his son said in front of everything he'd done. And Nachiketa, as young men do, turned toward him and said, I accept. And now it's time for our young man, Nachiketa, to enter what the poet Dante called the dark wood that one finds at a certain point in life, the unknown. And so Nachiketa said, all right, my father gives me to death. I will go and I will seek out death and find what I can learn. And he went deep into the forest and sat without moving for three days and three nights through pain and hunger and fear, waiting to see if death would appear. This is like the poet Kabir who said, I decided to go on a great pilgrimage. So I sat still for three days. And somehow Nachiketa knew that something had to die, that he had to confront something deeper that wasn't just the money of his father or the acclaim of the community. And I see this often when people will talk to me about depression or even suicide. And someone will say, I feel suicidal, or this person I know is asking me about suicide. 
And of course, our first response is to say, don't do it. It's the wrong thing to treasure life. But there's another deep response as well, which is to understand that something does have to die. It's not the body. The solution is not the body, but that that feeling that they have to die is really a false identity. The job that they can't do anymore, the relationship that's killing them, the speed, the grasping, all the things we've seen in the toxic qualities of our culture that have slowed down how somehow there's something in that person that says, I know something has to die and they get confused and think the body is that which it is. But it's something deeper that's called. And in us, there's an intuitive wisdom that knows that we can go to a descent. So Nachiketa went to the kingdom of death. And after three days of not moving and the fire in his body and the pain and the fear and the dark of the forest and everything that we confront in meditation times a hundred for not moving through three days and nights, he found himself at the kingdom of death. But Lord Yama, the king of death, wasn't there. Only his assistants, war, pestilence, and famine were there. He asked for the king of death, and they said, I'm sorry, he's out collecting rent. You will have to wait. And so Nachiketa waited longer. And finally, when death returned, his assistants said, you know, there's a very unusual young man who's come here to see you. And the Lord of Death sat opposite Nachiketa and said, you are indeed unusual for you sat for three days and nights to come see me. And then I wasn't here and you sat for three more days and nights. And because you've come in this amazing or in this remarkable way, a courageous young man. And because I have not received you directly in a worthy way. I will offer you three boons, three wishes. Now, of course, we're in the mythological territory of a, of a fairy tale. What are the three wishes that the king of death has offered to Nachiketa and that are part of this story that has been told for thousands of years? So Nachiketa sat. And he asked for his first of three boons. The first was, I asked for the blessing of forgiveness. And this is why we teach metta now at the beginning of our retreats and we weave it into our meditation and to mindfulness, why we call it mindful loving awareness. Nachiketa said, I ask that my father forgive me and that I forgive him that my father could see me with the eyes he saw me when I was his first born son. And the reason that this was the first boon that he asked is because we can't go any further in the liberation of the heart and the freedom that we seek without starting with the balm of compassion and forgiveness and love. For we've all been disappointed We've all been betrayed. We've all been hurt. In so many ways, ourself and others. And in the end, if we are to live in a free life, what Nachiketa was seeking, a new life, a death and rebirth, it starts with a forgiving heart. To not put another being out of our heart. There is a extraordinary book by Pumla Kaboda Marikizela, who was one of the great South African uh, psychologists and masters who helped with the truth and, truth and reconciliation process. And she decided in her work to try to understand what she called the evil that had come upon people. And she spent a year going into the prison to talk to the architect 
of apartheid who had ordered the deaths and killings of so many, amending to cock. And she sat opposite him week after week after week, talking to him and listening to him. This is recorded in her book. And one night after listening and talking on and on, he said, I think that I lost it all. It's the feeling of loss. The first thing that goes is innocence. There's no more fairy tales or Bambi. That's gone. We killed a lot of people and they killed some of ours. We fought for nothing. We fought each other basically eventually for nothing. We could all have been alive having a beer. So I'm confused. I'm so very tired and he hung his head down and shifted his, his legs to adjust to the chains that bound him to the chair, his eyes downcast like someone reflecting on the greatest tragedy and loss in his life. And the fact that she could go and sit with him and listen with an open heart and a curious and a not even compassion, but an interest in an understanding and a, a presence was the very energy that the truth and reconciliation process grew out of. We all have forgiveness to do. And in this difficult time, we're asked to do some reflections in the heart. What do you have to forgive, small and large, for your heart to be free? Some of it is self-forgiveness. Some of it's forgiveness of others, asking forgiveness. But holding yourself with tenderness. My old faults, like snow falling on warm ground. When we hold ourselves with self-compassion, even the difficulties are held in a new way. I remember sitting with Ram Dass and he told the story of being with his guru, Neem Karoli Baba. And Neem Karoli Baba looked at Ram Dass with so much love and gave him very simple instructions. He said, Ramdas, love everybody. And then he paused and he said, Ramdas, tell the truth. Now these sound like beautiful spiritual instructions, right? But as Ramdas said, I was surrounded by this whole coterie of Westerners who had come because I was with the guru and I was irritated by them. They were taking up time and the more I looked they were there on their own ego trips and they were puffing themselves up and they were grasping and grabbing and they were neurotic and their personalities were quite unappealing in many cases. And I looked at them and I said, ah, but my guru said, tell the truth. The truth was I hated them. I didn't like them. I wanted them out of there. And then he said, Ram Dass, love everybody. And that was his koan. And he sat with it. And he worked with it and he said one day he was sitting there looking in the eyes of his guru with that glance of mercy from his guru that is the name for when someone sees you so deeply, so lovingly that it changes the cells of your body and you remember that you are love. And he looked and he said, all these crazy Westerners like me who came, I love them all. I love every single one of them. And it was a breakthrough and a transformation. And it asks us, what do we have to forgive for our hearts to be free? This was Nachi Keita's first boon. And it's yours as we go through this descent because it is difficult. It's difficult for all of us collectively and in our families, in our communities, and as a society. And forgiveness, this forgiveness doesn't mean that we accept 
things that are being done that cause suffering, that we don't try to change them to stand up for matters, to stand up for care and justice for everyone. What it means is that in the end, we don't put anyone out of our heart, that we can wish everyone, may you be free from hatred. May you be free from fear. May you be free from ignorance. So Nachi Keta received his first boon and his heart became softened and he was able to now live through the next part of his deep initiation as you must do. To reclaim your heart in the middle of all that's so difficult. What would his second boon be? And he turned back to Lord Yama and he said, the second boon I asked for is inner fire is courage. Remember, he's a young man, you know, the kind that says, is there anything dangerous to do around here? I remember that. I remember going in the forest monastery and saying, what are the wildest austerities you guys do? Show me, let me try them out. You know, that's kind of what we want to do. You want to prove yourself, but more than that, you want to find something deep in yourself. As Durkheim said, something that's unshakable. And he wanted to come fully alive. So he asked for this unshakable spirit. And here's a poem from Anton Taylor. Again, Voices from South Africa. The sun rose each day, and we, the South Africans, waited from across the world. The stories came, carried by terror. From across the world, the virus came. The sun rose each day, and so did the numbers. The streets quieted, the soldiers came, not always in that order. Unable to see or hear or hold each other, we had to unlearn how we showed love. We wondered, what will it feel like? But no one could tell us. We did not know that we were grieving, only that we were grieving for something unknowable, yet certain. So we, the South Africans, waited. The sun rises each day, and so do the numbers. Because I not, cannot hold you, I must cling to these precious things. Truths I do know, immutable facts, which are immune to a virus. I do know we are South Africans. We have endured what most others have not. We, the South Africans, have survived many times that which is unfathomable. If pain builds resilience, and if one can suffer without succumbing to cruelty, then perhaps, although many of us are sick and poor and unable to self-isolate, we are prepared in a way that is not as apparent, in a manner not born of wealth or infrastructure. You see, in a part of us so deep that it is fathomless, there's a key to choose, I or us to rise together. And those of us who've already lived apart, but together through so much, we've been asked to decide. There's so much I do not know, but I do know we are South Africans. I do know our decision was made long before this pandemic, many times over. We have chosen us. I do know one day the sun will rise and the numbers will not. And this is what Nachi Keita asked for. He asked for that strength of heart to go through everything that was difficult. And it's never too late to start. This is the time, as one of our great founders says, one person with courage is a majority standing up for justice, caring for others in the middle of this time, speaking the truth with love. 
As Nelson Mandela says, do not judge me by my successes, judge me by, by how many times I fell down and got back up again. And this is your humanity. And this is what's possible for you. And so the second boon was granted to Nachiketa. And now it's the last boon. It's the last gift, the last blessing. And Nachiketa sat quietly. And he looked at Lord Yama and he said, what I ask now is a great boon. I wish to know that which is immortal. Kind of audacious young guy he was. His last wish. And Lord Yama looked back at him and said, really? You could have anything. Here, look at this. And he showed him visions of royal chariots with great steeds, basically the you know, Ferraris of the day and bevies of, you know, beautiful women and consorts and the best of banquets. You could have anything. Make sure that this is your true wish. And Nachiketa replied with a question. Will not all of these return to your kingdom soon enough. And Lord Yama had to nod and reply and say yes, for all of these things are temporal, are impermanent. They rise for a time and they pass away. So Lord Yama said, then I will give you your answer. And he brought Nachiketa an extraordinary gift, a beautiful mirror handcrafted there in the underworld. And he said, I place this mirror in your hand and with it pose a question to you that will be the gateway to immortality itself. And the question I pose for you is, who am I really? Look deeply in this mirror and see. It's what the Zen masters ask when they say, who are you or what is this life, this great mystery of life? And you sit with that koan day and night, what is this, who am I? But it happens in a moment when you go in the bathroom and look in the mirror and notice your body has aged, that the fur is missing in some parts, that it droops in other parts. You know how it is, wrinkles are coming, it's changing its shape. But even though you notice that your body has changed, there's that weird experience that you don't necessarily feel older. You know that. And that's because it's only your body that's aged but the consciousness, the loving awareness, the witness of it, who you really are in that moment steps back and says, hmm, how's this body doing in this incarnation? Oh, it's sagging here and it's learning there and it's getting this way or that way. You start to see who you are is not this body, but the awareness itself. You become the witness, the consciousness itself. This is from Be Here Now, speaking of Ram Dass. He says, as we awaken, we watch the entire drama of our lives. We watch, watch the illusion with unbearable compassion. For you are all form, you are breath, you are the river, you are the void, the desire and the illusion and the awakening beyond it. For you are beyond space and time, nothing and everything. Everything is me. And we see it all form and eternity as a miracle. Then you enter the marketplace 
with bliss bestowing hands, you chop wood and carry water. You return to the world to be in the world, but not of the world. And in all that you're going through, the difficulties and the fears, know that this is not the end of the story. We human beings have been through earthquakes and floods, tornadoes and tsunamis, and epochs that include epidemics and pandemics over the centuries. And we've survived. It's in our genes, it's in our cells, it's in your nervous system and in your collective memory and in your heart. And it was passed on to you by your ancestors and their ancestors generation after generation. We know how to do this. And when you get quiet and you get the boons that Nachi Kate has asked for, the loving and forgiving heart, the courage that is not an absence of fear, but the courage to be true to yourself and what matters, even when fear arises. And then you remember who you are, the great heart of compassion itself. You get still and quiet. And this from my beloved Trudy who wrote, when you go out and see the empty streets, the empty stadiums, the empty train platforms, don't say to yourself, it looks like the end of the world. What you're seeing is love in action. What you're seeing in that negative space is how much we do care for each other, for our grandparents, our parents, our brothers, our sisters. Protecting people we will never meet. People will lose their jobs over this. Some will lose their businesses and some will lose their lives. All the more reason to take a moment when you're out on a walk or on your way to the store or watching the news to look into the emptiness and marvel at all that love. Let it fill you and sustain you. It isn't the end of the world. It is the most remarkable act of global solidarity we may ever witness. And when Nachi Keita had received this third blessing and looked deeply into the mirror to ask, who am I really? And could see that he was in fact consciousness itself. As Thich Nhat Han says, since before time I've been free, birth and death are only doors through which I pass. This body is not me, I am life without boundaries. I've never been born and never died. He stepped out of the land of the Lord of death into the unborn, into the timeless, into the loving consciousness that gives birth to all that we really are, that was born into your body. And he could see the world with the eyes of love and return to it then like the old man in the Zen pictures going back into the marketplace with his wine bottle and his staff saying, and all I look upon with love become enlightened. For something then becomes holy. Every spring crocus and newborn fawn and plum and apple blossom. And I watched my year and a half old grandson pick up a pebble and he could stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon or the biggest marvel of the world and say, look, look at this red pebble. It's a mystery. Isn't it beautiful? To Baba and Nini, his grandparents. Yeah. I believe it was in Leaves of Grass Whitman said, a mouse is miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels. Just the existence of life of ours and others in this planet among the vast galaxies. And here we are, 
And yes, we've been through pandemics and epidemics. And what Nachiketa realized was that there was something bigger and more beautiful that he could find. And it wasn't just in the vastness, but it was in the tenderness between people and what we touch and how we listen. A poem by James Davis May. Even on the night my friend died, even on that night, the feral cat, the one that's white and fluffy, still crossed our driveway quietly from our neighbor's pines to our own rhododendrons. Even on that night, she would look for some rodent or bird to terrorize. And I, drinking and grieving on our deck, was appalled by the world and its gross refusal to stop being the world. And then embarrassed, not just by my own naivete, but by innate human sickness that believes we mattered, that something or someone is listening, that civility isn't just something we imagined and don't really follow anyway. That night, I wanted everything to be better than it is. So I went to the fridge, got out the milk, poured it into a little bowl, which I left on the porch and found empty the next morning. And this is what we have really we have gestures of kindness and greatness of heart. We have forgiveness. We have the compassion that can hold all that those, all those who are living and all that those that are frightened and to know that we can do this together. And one day the sun shall rise and the numbers will not. So I hope what I've offered you as the practice that we did together in the beginning, which in a way was the complete teachings for tonight. And then the bedtime story, which is uh, a story to feed some other part of your being as a reminder, as a possibility, as a soothing and steadying, as an awakening. I hope it has been food for the heart. I thank you for being part of this, for offering your goodness to the world and encourage you to see what you can do and to be that one steady one on the boat, as Thich Nhat Hanh says. And I encourage you to take your time at the end of the day to sit quietly and tend your own body and heart and mind with loving awareness at the beginning of the day to settle yourself and set your best intention. And in little bits in the day after you clean the stove and walk the dog or diaper the child or answer the email or go on the endless Zoom until you get Zoom crazed, and you take a breath and feel yourself on the earth let your heart soften, hold it all with compassion, say thank you for trying to protect me and take care of me and live in a great heart of love. It is your birthright. It is who you really are. Thank you and good night. Allow your eyes to close gently. And this will be a practice that combines elements of mindfulness, mindful, loving awareness and other dimensions. So as you begin to sit, you do what I do at the end of the day, actually. And when I sit, um, first take a couple of deep breaths and release whatever tension there is that you can let go of easily with those breaths.
And then as I start to pay attention, I realize that I have to sense my own body, my heart and mind in a deeper way than when I'm going through the tasks of the day, whether it's doing the dishes or offering teachings or interacting with others. Um, I really need to sit quietly and tune in and find a different dimension of possibility. And as I do, I find there are all kinds of things that are beneath the surface that my body goes into fight, flight, or freeze, picking up the alarm of the world around me or my own fears. My heart does. So as you sit quietly now, having taken those breaths, let yourself feel a sense of connection to the earth, a grounding in which almost as if you had energetic roots going from your body into the earth, steadiness, deep, connected. Your body comes from the earth. It's part of the earth and feel that strength and steadiness. You take your seat halfway between heaven and earth in this human form and let your roots go deeply into the earth, steady, strong. And now from this place of presence, begin to pay attention to the experience just now. And we'll go through the dimensions of mindful, loving awareness. First, bring your attention to the whole field of your body. The sensations, the energy of the body, the areas of tightness or tension that come from this fight, flight, or freeze that gets triggered in us, the areas of hot or cold, of pleasure or pain. Feel the whole energy field of the body with a loving awareness that has no judgment, but is kind and curious. And as you do, let the places of the greatest tension and the greatest holding in your body, invite them to open, to increase, to get stronger, to, to spread out through your body or beyond. Invite them to show you what you're holding and you receive them in the space of mindful, loving awareness. And as you allow the sensations and the intensity of tension or pain, all the things held, to open, to get stronger, to expand, to show themselves, to be received. Notice how as they expand, they also soften, become more spacious. And now bring in the quality of compassion to hold all that your body's been holding with a compassionate awareness. And say to your body, thank you. Thank you for trying to protect me. Thank you for taking care of me. And as you do, notice how the body softens with that gratitude 
how holding it all with compassion and kindness, just as you are now, like you would hold a child who's going through a hard time. Such tenderness, thank you. It's okay. I'm all right for now. And notice how the body relaxes and opens as you do. It breathes easier, space opens up. You're allowing the body to release and come to a greater, more natural presence, just as it wants. To open, to be felt all of it and receive with love tenderness. Now shift this same mindful loving awareness to the area of your heart. And notice what feelings and emotions are present. I notice at the end of the day that there's an accumulation. There might be grief, deep tears of sadness. There might be fear, anxiety, longing, love, joy mixed together with all the rest. With this mindful, loving awareness, sense what's there in your heart that asks to be felt, that you're carrying. Sometimes carrying for a long time. And let it open. Let it intensify, let it get stronger, more painful or more beautiful, more sad. Let the feelings open in the vast space of loving awareness, fill your body and more. Let them show you what your heart is carrying and you become the loving witness, allowing the heart to be felt all of it. And as you hold and allow all these feelings to intensify and open, the tears, the fear, the longing, the love, hold them again with compassion, like you'd hold a crying or frightened child. Tenderly, not trying to fix them, but honoring them. And say thank you. Thank you for trying to protect me. All these feelings. Thank you for trying to keep me safe. I'm okay for now. Thank you, thank you for everything you do. And notice what happens in the heart, how spaciousness grows naturally, how the feelings are received and soften. And how the gratitude, thank you, and compassion for all of them for trying to protect me opens a space of tenderness and presence.
And now bring your attention to your mind, that very busy organ, sometimes considered located in the brain, but actually much bigger than that, filled with cycles of thoughts and images, and perhaps now repeated patterns of worry and concern and imagination and cycling and circling and busy. Feel all the energy of the mind. Just notice what it's like. And hold it too with loving awareness. Invite it to open, to display, to show its energy. Let it get more intense if it wants. Let it cycle and twist and get wild and imagine and feel all that energy and give it space to show you the energy of the mind. And bring in a tenderness, a compassion to hold all these energies with kindness. They're just doing their job. And as you do and things soften, you can say thank you. Thank you to your mind, that over busy organ. Thank you. Thank you for trying to protect me. Bow with gratitude. Thank you. I'm okay just now. I'm okay. You can relax. And notice how the mind too softens and settles when you allow all the energies to be held in compassion and loving awareness, when you offer gratitude, everything softens. And now begin to notice something quite remarkable and important and liberating. As the Buddha would say, the essence of liberation. Notice that the body with all its sensations and experiences, the heart with all its emotions, feelings and the mind that you are able to pay attention to these with awareness itself and shift your attention to realize that you are this awareness. You are this loving awareness, not the body, although you're gifted with this body in this incarnation, and not the waves of emotion, the love and the longings and the fears, and not the thoughts and images, sense that you are the witnessing consciousness itself. You are the space of awareness that knows this all. Timeless, open, vast, silent, filled with love and tenderness for all the struggles of the body and mind and life around. 
and rest in this deep loving awareness, who you really are. And in this loving awareness, like an ocean of peace or stillness, vastness that contains everything, let yourself sense that just as you can be aware of body and heart and mind, you can also be aware of the field of being of the beings all around you, those making love and those in fear and those being born and those who are sick or dying, the vastness of beings and that your loving awareness can extend and become a kind of loving compassion, just as you hold your own body and heart and mind with tenderness. Now let the vastness of your loving awareness extend in every direction. As if you could hold this whole world in the great heart of tender compassion. You can. This is your birthright, your Buddha nature. Born into you is the great heart of compassion and timeless understanding. And send out well wishes of love and tenderness in every direction. from this place of stillness, deep compassion. You become the lamp, the beacon, the healing heart. The medicine of the awakened heart the medicine of love offered to all, holding all. When a child is born, our first response is one of love. When a person is dying, our last response is to hold their hand in love. Who we really are is love itself, our true nature. Loving awareness, consciousness itself, rest in it. Return to it. It is your home.